Thank you very much, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, like Andy said, this is number two of a four-part series. Uh, today, we're really going to focus on description and interpretation. Um, I am going to discuss a few um, uh, abnormalities that you're going to find, but that's we're going to focus more of that on the third presentation. Uh, that's where we're going to go through a lot of volumes. Uh, I'm going to show a, a lot of you know incidental findings that you're going to find on a daily basis as you're looking through your your volumes. And then, of course, the fourth one uh, is going to be uh, you know incidental findings that you're going to. Make. So I am going to go through some cases today, but I, I really want to stress that today it's really about getting a good description. And when you have a good description, that's going to alert, uh, lean towards the interpretation. Uh, to describe what interpretation is, that's that's your impression. So if you get a good description and it's corticated and so forth, then the next step is to basically uh, decide is it odontogenic or non-odontogenic, is it a cyst or a tumor? And then that's the step prior to your differential diagnosis. Uh, I just want to cover a few slides that I think are important, just to repeat from last, just a few slides, uh, just repeat from uh, the last presentation, because uh, if you're new or you, you uh, uh, didn't hear the first presentation, um, I really feel like th some of these slides are, are missed when you're taking a volume, and I, and I need to stress that they are very, very important. Uh, so basically, when it comes to KVP and MA, uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the physics behind it, and I described it last week. Uh, but basically, these numbers uh, can be adjusted on pretty much all machines. Uh, and description is a clinical situation where if you have two patients, one has a lot of restorations, we're talking about implants, amalgam, PFMs, uh, versus a patient that has none of that, you know, when, when you hit the, the button and it's already pre-decided what the KBP and MA is, that patient with a lot of restorations is going to have a lot of scatter, it's going to have a lot of... Um, beam hardening and it just changing those numbers a little bit uh, you're going to get a lot better uh, uh, image uh, so basically you know cpc basics it, it basically this machine goes around the patient's head between uh, 270 and 360 degrees uh, you get a whole bunch of slices basically cefs that are then uh, reformatted uh, we're lucky as dentists that we have the capability, you have to understand medical MDC, uh, so multi-detector CTs in hospitals, uh, they don't give you the capabilities to necessarily look at the sagittal, look at the coronal, and especially in dentistry, we can now uh, completely adjust, uh, so have a modified axial uh, to, to look down a tooth or, or so forth. I know there's a bit of delay, uh, just, just to uh, repeat, um, you know, if, if there's any questions, please, please stop me. Uh, you know, let's make this interactive. So if, if there's anything I'm going too fast or there's, you know, a questions while we're on the, on the fly, you know, I, I don't mind answering some of them. Uh, but to, to really uh, get everybody on the same page, I know some people might, you know, have a lot of knowledge on cone beam CT, others might not. Uh, but you have the three main views. Of course, you have a few other views, you know, your reconstructed panoramic, you have your 3D views, but these are the three main ones. So your axial is going to be parallel to the floor. <clears throat> Coronal is then going to be um, uh, parallel to the front of the patient's face. This is great for looking at the nasal cavity, great at looking uh, at the maxillary, the paranasal sinuses, and the final one being sagittal. And sagittal, that's going to be going from your left and right. Uh, and the, the center line, of course, is what's called your mid-sagittal line. So on that note, Dr. Morcha, we actually have uh, a couple of questions already. We have one asking, um, what recommendations do you have to reduce scatter when taking an image? And what size millimeter cuts are used in CBCT? So it, it really varies. Uh, every machine is, is pretty different. Um, and, and I was asked this question last week as well. Uh, I, I'm comfortable if a patient has a lot of restorations, a lot of uh, metals in their mouth. Uh, some of these cone beam CTs have uh, algorithms where you can uh, change it or in a situation where if it's a, let's say a larger woman, uh, you don't press the, the, the woman button, you, you would then press the man button because most of these machines have those three settings. <clears throat> what was the second part of the question, Andy? It was what size millimeter cuts are used in CBCT? 
Uh, so it really varies. Uh, some of these machines are built maybe more for endodontics. They get down to 80 microns. Uh, the average is about two, 300 uh, microns, so 0.3 millimeters. Uh, I still consider the gold standard your reconstructed panoramic view. This is a great image that you're going to be able to see the condyles. You can see the sinuses, uh, all the dentition, and have a really good general idea of, of what you're looking at. Uh, of course, going through the slices and then doing something specific for the uh, TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint, uh, you have other uh, features. And almost all these machines come with the software that give you those capabilities. Uh, but I still think, you know, the reconstructed panoramic is, is still the gold standard for, for looking at these images and getting a, a good general idea. Um, I really wanted to show you uh, uh, a report and, you know, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not trying to, you know, push that, you know, get your radiologist report uh, done by, you know, uh, a radiologist or not, you know, something that you may, maybe have the capabilities to do yourself. Uh, but the point is, when you look at these reports, it, what we're going to be talking about today goes along the same path. So if you have a good description, which is here, this leads you to uh, a good impressions and, um, and uh, differential diagnosis. So the workflow is still pretty much the same. Um, everyone's going to have their own technique of how they look at a volume, but if you keep it the same way every time you look at a volume, you become more efficient at it. Uh, and the one example is, you know, we all have our own technique. Uh, you know, my wife is a dentist as well, and, you know, she can probably do a filling in 15 minutes versus me. I haven't been in an operatory for about four years now. It would take me, you know, probably half an hour to an hour to do a single filling. So the more times that you look at these volumes, the more times that you go about it in a systematic way, you know, look at the condyles, look at the paranasal sinuses, look at the calcifications in the neck. Uh, and if you repeat it every time, uh, you just, you, of course, you, you get, uh, you know, more and more efficient at it. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it was kind of asked already, uh, you know, every machine has different settings and uh, has a different dose. Uh, it was asked last time, you know, what are those doses? Uh, you know, some machines will, will give the, um, well, we'll say that you know they as low as a uh, as a, as low as a panoramic, or you know three times the the, the the dose of a panoramic. It is possible. I've seen some of these images, and uh, you know you're you're going to be losing some anatomy. And I'm not saying you know hit your patients with more and more dose. You know there's no good amount of radiation, but having a slightly higher uh, dose, you're going to get a better image at the end of the day. <clears throat> Perfect example is I, I've seen some of these, you know, the, the low dose machines, uh, you know, you, you just can't trace that mandibular canal. Well, what was the point if you're placing an implant or you're removing a third molar and you can't see the mandibular canal, you know, it would have been worth it just a little, little higher dose and, and you're going to see a lot more anatomy and structures. So this is the main point of the presentation, um, how to interpret pathology, okay? so. There, and I, I always, you know, repeat over and over, systematic approach, systematic approach. Uh, but this, these are the three steps to get to a good differential diagnosis. Uh, number one, you need a good description. As soon as you have a very, very good description, that will lead you to impression or interpretation. And again, what I mean by that is after the diagnosis, uh, uh, sorry, the description, this is going to lead you be, you know, to start thinking, oh, is this potentially a cyst? Is this potentially a tumor? And from there, you can get your differential diagnosis because, of course, there's multiple different kind of cysts, there's multiple kind of tumors, but at least you got into that general uh, uh, workflow. So this might remind you of dental school. This is still the same approach that you know a, a radiologist uses uh, or anybody you know that's looking at these volumes to uh, analyze for pathology or analyze what a, 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 the finding might be you still go about it within this, uh, these steps. And I repeat location because if you guys remember from dental school, um, if there is a lesion above the mandibular canal, most likely it's gonna be odontogenic. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it's most likely. If it's below the mandibular canal, it has to most likely, it's gonna be non-odontogenic. Um, internal structure, this is where you're looking at, is it radiolucent, radiopaque? 
in, uh, in uh, when you're looking at cone beam CT, the proper term is high density or low density, uh, just like MRI, you know, it's not radio opaque, radio lucent, it's, it's based on intensity, you know, uh, hypotense or, or, or uh, high intensity. Um, the periphery, this is a big one. This is your corticated outlines. Is it well-defined or is it not? Um, of course, you know, if, if you have a lesion that's corticated, that means your body's reacting, it's trying to defend itself. And so that's where you're going to get these shapes versus something ill-defined. You, you don't know where that lesion starts and how it blends with the, the adjacent bone. <clears throat> Uh, localized versus generalized, you know, something like um, uh, fibrous dysplasia, that that's going to be, you know, the entire mandible or, you know, the mandible in the, in the, in the zygoma. Um, that's more generalized versus just localized, a single lesion. Uh, the difference between that and the single versus multifocal, if you guys remember your cemental osseous dysplasia, you can have florid, which is going to be multiple at the apices of the uh, teeth versus something being singular. You know, unilateral, uh, not unilateral, sorry, uh, um, uh, multilocular versus unilocular. Uh, another big one is extension. Uh, where is that lesion going? Is it going throughout the entire mandible? Is it extending within the cortical outlines versus what's the effects on the surrounding structures? Resorption is going to lead you to a different diagnosis than uh, a teeth that are going to be displaced. Teeth being displaced is most likely going to be something more tumoral, uh, a tumor. Uh, neoplasm, uh, or is the cortical outlines of the bone expanded? Are they interrupted? Are they perforated? Is going to also lead you to a different kind of diagnosis. But again, this if you, if you really focus on the images and you really write down a really good description, uh, then then you're going to lead into a good uh, interpretation and then also a differential diagnosis. All right, so let's go through a few cases here. I'm not going to give you the diagnosis on this one yet. I'm going to save it for later because I really want us to focus on what is the description here. So here we have something location, right mandible. Looks low density, multilocular. Let's get a few more images here. Here's some cross sections. Interruption of the uh, uh, avular ridge. As you can see, it's, it's a lower density, soft tissue density. You can tell it's not uh, you know, based on the, the surrounding structures, it's not affecting the, uh, the implants, but it is looking like it's interrupting the mandibular canal. I'm just going to grab my mouse here and I'm going to point at a little area. This is going to be key when we do get into the uh, in, in differential diagnosis. You have to understand, if, again, if you get a good, uh, uh, you look at this and it looks scary, it looks awful, but you just have to go about it and really slow down and think about what you're looking at. And there's always going to be one or two clues. You know, radiology is detective work. It's, it's just in like the clinic. Patient has pain on a, in, in an area of the mandible. Well, you're going to do your, your endodontic testing. You're going to, you know, check for vitality. And it's the same thing. It's just detective work. You have to gather all the information that you have. And then you're going to get to a really good uh, differential diagnosis. All right. I'm going to slow down a little bit because... You know, if you didn't have time to really look at the image and write down what you think it might be or where all these findings are. So let's see how close you might be to, you know, what, what my findings were. So location, right posterior mandible. Internal structure, low density. It's ill-defined. It's not corticated. It's, it looks like it's, it's, it's messing around with it, all the bone around it. You can kind of see the margins, but not perfectly. The shape, it's irregular. And the biggest finding was that is, is the effect on surrounding structures, the bone is interrupted, perforated. We did not see any, a significant expansion. Let's just go back, potentially some expansion, but not significant enough. And look at those cortical outlines. They're non-uniformly thinned. So there, there's, some, you know, there's something potentially bad going on here. Okay, let's look at another one. So think about what the description was and look how different this lesion looks. And again, I am going to, we are going to go back uh, in a few slides and I'm, we're going to go through the impression and then our differential diagnosis. And I'll give you a few. Even though almost all these cases were biopsied, we do have the, the, uh, the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis. So this one. Uniformly thinned cortical outline. I'm not sure you can tell. It's not. 
the, the dentition aren't associated with it. They're just inferior to the dentition. Or the finding is just inferior to the dentition. There's low density. There's no, not a lot of expansion. Doesn't look like there's much expansion, if there's any at all, because I really think it's that the thinning of the cortical outlines that's giving that, uh, uh, that appearance. All right, so how close were you to what I have? And again, we'll, we'll slow down because I know there's a little bit of a lag. So maybe you didn't have enough time to write all your findings. The location, anterior mandible. Internal structure, we said that, low density or, or radio uh, lucent. Periphery, very well defined and corticated. So now this, this one's not looking so scary. I, I didn't see any interruption of the cortical outlines, the shape, unilocular, regular. Could it be something bad? Yes, but I, let, let's, let's work with what we actually do see and we know. Okay, so now let, let's talk about impression and then I'm going to give you the, those diagnoses. This next slide is amazing. This, um, this really gives you an idea of, of the impression. So like I was saying, we're not looking for a differential diagnosis right now. We want to be put, you know, funnel all the, the you know, thousands of different kind of uh, lesions and get in the direction where we think it is. This is a beautiful little workflow. These are the most common findings. There is some overlap, you know, you know but it, in general, this, this is what you're going to be looking at. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to really see this. This is, you know, this, this explains pretty much a, a, a whole bunch. Um, so the main lesions, you're looking at inflammatory, that's your rarefying osteitis. Um, uh, th this is where, um, you know, you, you, this, this is your stereotypical apical pathosis. The next more, most common, of course, you're looking at cysts. Big difference here is now, um, you know, the, there's been degeneration of that inf inflammation, and now you're going to have epithelial lining. So there are different treatments, but, you know, we're, we're not talking about treatment right now. Show, showing how there's a, an approach, uh, systematic, of how description, we're going to find the impressions, our interpretation, and then from there, we can decide what kind of cyst or what kind of tumor. Uh, dysplasia is quite common. Most of the time, you're not, I, I've rarely seen any congenital, systemic, or metabolic uh, abnormalities. Uh, usually the most common being uh, hyper, uh, hyperparathyroidism, uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, but most of the time, these patients already know that, you know, they're, they're, when they're coming in, what they might have versus, you know, a, a lesion versus a, a tumor or malignancy. Those, these are findings that you can find. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the, the list of description anymore, but you got to think, radiolucent, radiopaque, or high density, low density, what are some of the findings here? Corticated, it's nice and round. Um, there's expansion into the maxillary sinus. It's involving teeth. Andy, can you read me some of the answers that people are typing? I'm just curious, like how close uh, we're getting on on our uh, on our impressions. So this looks. So I don't. So I don't have too many. I don't really have any uh, submissions right now from doctors. Okay. Um, I've been kind of troubleshooting a lot of audio options, uh, audio problems. Excuse me, from some of the uh, attendees, but. Um, I think that should be resolved now, but I'm having, uh, now I'm having some input. We have cystic abscess, periapical granuloma, necrotic number 15, failing root canal treatment number 14. That That's amazing. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's detective work. You know, we, we were given so much information, but there's going to be one or two findings that really lead us into the correct diagnosis. And you know, whoever said endodontically treated, boom. So this is you know persistent rarefying osteitis with cystic appearance. Uh, but you can see that that tooth is fully involved. Uh, there's no displacement, and that that's really the the correct uh, diagnosis. It was a cyst. 
All right. Description, low density. And this one is pretty much slam dunk because there's one finding which is just, it makes it uh, very clear what, what it is. Uh, when this lesion was found 100 years ago and described a certain way, that description has not changed if you have a periapical, uh, a panoramic, or a cone beam CT. But what, what do we see? That low density corrugated is surrounding the crown, going from the cemental enamel junction to cemental enamel ju ju uh, <clears throat> junction. So we are having some submissions for dentigerous cysts, radicular cysts, a lot of uh, dentigerous cysts. Absolutely. And again, you know, there, there's a lot of, it, and again, detective work. This patient's a little younger. Uh, so, you know, extraction would be fine, curatage. Uh, the one scary thing about dentigerous cysts in an in a elderly person there is a risk of a uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So if they're, they're very old or they are older uh, and there's a dentigerous cyst, it, it's recommended to uh, get a biopsy. Okay, so back to this guy. And again, we're, we're, we already did a great description. So before we even jump into a differential, I'm gonna give you that differential, but where does this belong? This finding, is, is it a bone dysplasia? No, so now that we've decided that's not display, dysplastic, we can put that on the shelf and not think about it again. So at this point, once you decide where this lesion belongs in, in these uh, in, impressions, then we can get a differential diagnosis that fits that box. So as soon as you say it's not bone dysplasia, we shouldn't go back and visit that. Does it look malignant? It did not look malignant. But it does so look we have, cystic. Okay. So we have a quick question over uh, your previous slide when you mentioned that could be dangerous for older patients. Uh, we have a question asking if you could specify how old is older. Well, you got to think. So the third molar, if it was impacted, I, I would say anything above forty-five to fifty. You know, this—that's when your body, you know, uh, you know, changes happen, and, and you got to think: uh, where did that dentigerous cyst come from? How old? Was a patient when they had it so you know they potentially as soon as that tooth did not erupt and is impacted um then you know that that they're they're in the they're in the early 20s so now that cyst has just been sitting there in the jaw for 25 years or so awesome thank you so we have quite a few uh suggestions for the image you have up right now we have traumatic bone cysts globulomandibular cysts benign neoplasia traumatic bone cysts uh, atraumatic bone cavity, benign neoplasia, hemangioma, um, and someone asking if these are two separate lesions or just one? This is just one lesion. And whoever said traumatic bone cysts, this was biopsied. There was nothing in that cavity. There was no fluid. There was nothing. It was empty. So that's where we're leaning straight to traumatic bone cysts. But again, so we're, we're trying to, from that description, uh, we're trying to get to a differential diagnosis. And so we know that it seems cystic, also benign neoplasia. Because uh, another differential, if you just saw this without a biopsy, you would then have to also consider potentially uh, odontogenic keratocyst, uh, OKC or KOT, depending uh, um, when you graduated. Uh, but that's, you know, now, now we've funneled into those two potential uh, impressions. And then from there, we know, hey, you know, get a biopsy. We know which direction to go to versus, let's say, it looked like bone dysplasia. You just leave that alone. Um, neoplasms or tumors, it gets a little messy here. Again, you don't need to know, hey, was it hyperplasia? Was it a hematoma? Uh, again, you know, you're, you're just you're getting into that that direction. Um, uh, if you're curious, react. Uh, uh, Reactive tumor, you're, you're looking at uh, CGCG, hematoma, if, if you know that's your uh, um, odontoma, and they're, you're, they're normally self limiting hematomas. So, tumors, again, 
always little cues, one or two small findings that will help you lead into the correct direction. So on a tumor, it's going to be expansile. So it's going to be pushing the cortical bone. It's going to be pushing bone and, and, and uh, teeth versus you saw does um, it, uh, 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 cysts usually do not do that. They're going to go around structures. All right, this is a very, very rare lesion. I had to throw this in there because it just shows. So looking at it, it it's radiopaque or high density. And look how it's just, it's pushing that tooth. It's pushing all the teeth. And you can see the reconstructed panoramic. And one tooth is almost totally out of, out of the cortical bone. So again, you know, we, we have a few little cues. that now this is, we're, we're thinking about a tumor. And I'm really curious what some of the people's answers are on this one. This is very, it's quite rare. This is the only time I've ever seen it. So we have some odontoma, ameloblastoma, ossifying fibromyalgia, uh, osteogenic sarcoma, Osteosarcoma, multiple myeloma, pinborg tumor, fibrous dysplasia. dysplasia. So, you get the all, but you're, everyone was in that category, and everyone was, you know, thinking that it was, uh, you know, a neoplasm, benign, malignant. But you're, you're in the right category. You know, uh, it's, it's not a cyst. This is another really good one. This, this is a lot more common. There's like. Again, you know, get a good description. You can see the uh, cross section uh, that there's expansion. I was going to use my mouse here to, to show right on this image here. There's expansion. Uh, there's irregular thinning of the cortical outline. So again, being a detective, there should be almost right off the bat two differentials that you could think of. And it's and you're and you're also thinking it's it's going to be something that is uh, neoplasm or or tumoral. So we have some guesses for ameloblastoma, uh, pindorc tumor, fibroosseous dysplasia, odontogenic cysts, OKC, myzoma, another for ameloblastoma. Yep. So that, that was the two, the, the two, that was the direction everyone seemed that they were going. It's ameloblastoma. The only other differential that you might have in the back of your mind, just because there's so much interruption, there's a little too much expansion to, you know, for uh, OKC, but that's still a very, very good consideration. Okay, so we were looking at, th that was a mix between benign neoplasms and, you know, myeloblastoma is very aggressive, but it's still benign. It's not a malignancy. Malignancies, you're going to start seeing stuff like this where the bone is trying to, that, that's the periosteal uh, reaction. So the bone is trying to protect itself, but it's, it's just being destroyed it just as fast as it's being protected. You can see that onion skin, that's a stereotypical look, that sun ray appearance. The Kalman's triangle, you can see there's an acute angle coming off the bone, basically just it's being blasted. And so this one, again, a few cues, that we know what category it's in. Look at that destruction. There, the, the bone didn't even have time to react and save itself. It's just getting blown out. So that's the number one cue. Now there's other lesions that might look like that, but the second one makes it a slam dunk. And that's, you can, you can barely see it. And it, it, we were lucky when we were taking the image, uh, but with the mouse on, on, the, on the sagittal view, what is that? That's soft tissue reaction. So the body is, again, you know, that the, I'm pretty much giving the answer, but the malignancy is, is just, it's just destroying everything in its path. So we have some suggestions for SSC, osteocarsoma, uh, sarcoma. Yeah, and that, that's amazing. We, we're, we we're thinking malignancy. And, you know, those are different differentials. And, you know, just because I do have it doesn't mean that in a report you once consider the, you know, 
uh, the different firings. But yes, squamous cell carcinoma are carcinoma. or mandible will eventually occur via the Now, a dysfunctional swallow video. Okay, so this one looks scary. Same thing. But again, a few cues that make you lean in one direction or not. I'm not saying that you want biopsy this or you know for sure what the diagnosis is. We do know the di diagnosis, but the point is there's two major findings here. Number one, of course, has got the yellow arrow. Does anyone know what that is? That's sequestrum. So, okay, now, now we're thinking, okay, if there's a question there, you know, maybe we can, um, again, not saying that we don't biopsy it, but now, you know, you can reassure your patient and not scare them being like, oh my goodness, you know, you got cancer, you got to go to the hospital right now. This is like, now we got some cues, you can reassure the patients, uh, not re I should say reassure, because of course you still want to get that biopsy, uh, but then you don't have to scare them, you know, severely, because the second clue is look how bad that peri is. Uh, periodontal bone losses. You know, the, this, this is, if anyone guessed, also my lights. So it's funny how you can have just an inflammatory uh, reaction and squamous cell carcinoma look very, very similar. But again, just one or two little cues. Dr. Morchat, um, sorry to interrupt your, your presentation real quick, but um, I've been trying to kind of solve this on the background. We are hearing some sort of kind of background noise. And to my knowledge, um, unless I decide to personally speak, everyone else, myself included, should be muted. So is there any background noise in your office right now, or is there anything maybe playing in the background on your computer? Oh, actually, I thought it was someone was uh, on, on your side of the office. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure where that noise is coming from. Even if it was on, on my side of the office, I'm muted, and all my audio is coming through my, my headphones. So I'm not sure where the, the background noise is coming from. So I apologize, everyone, but I'll go ahead and try to try to figure it out in the meantime. All right, so back to, back to this guy. Again, when we did the description, it looked kind of scary. And again, there, there was a clue there that I pointed out. This here. And of course, you know, investigative work, you know, call a dentist, you know, and then you find the history very easily. And again, you don't have to write a report and scare everybody, you know, that this was malignancy, but that is a uh, bone specule from uh, the frication after an extracted tooth that ended up being infected. So that's your, so, okay, yeah. So the, the um, wh where, which direction are we going? We're thinking a neoplasm inflammatory. But again, a few clues and uh, in, uh, findings lean one uh, way more in one direction than the other. Again, biopsy is still recommended, but now this is something that can be cured with antibiotics instead of resectioning the entire bone. And so that was osteomyelitis. But again, look, look at the way it looks. That's, you know, I can guarantee you, I opened that volume and I was like, oh no. Dr. Morchat, we have a quick question. Um, Absolutely. Someone is asking, can you make a radiological, uh, radiological diagnosis without a biopsy confirmation, or is that only a differential diagnosis? That, that's just differential diagnosis. In, in a finding like this, it, again, I'm, I'm leaning more in one, I'm leaning more in one direction, but this is still something to be concerned about. Um, but I, I would highly you know, recommend uh, biopsy, but again, a few clues kind of are leaning us again, not to scare a patient and not be like, Oh geez, this is something really, really bad. We need to, you know, deal with this right away. Um, you would still need, need a, a biopsy. Um, a lot of findings, you know, radiological findings really lean, uh, in a certain direction and that you can, it, it's, it's the same thing, you know, not 95% of findings are going to be your rarefying osteitis, uh, you know, persistent rarefying osteitis on a tooth that's already endodontically treated. Uh, peripical, uh, uh, peripical scar, you know, and again, having all the information is really important because let's say there was widening at the apex of an endodontically treated tooth. Well, when was it endodontically treated? If it was just recent, then that could potentially just be a peripical scar and it, it's, it's healing itself versus if that was done a long time ago, 
uh, and there's a significant widening and interruption of the floor of the maxillary sinus, then that's something that you now need to treat. A very good question. Um, just th this, this is pretty much it. Um, you know, it's really important to, th there's a reason why we, why we have specialists. You know, the, the, the reason, the example I always give is, um, you know, referring a patient because there's an impacted third molar, that, that's going to your oral maxillofacial surgeon. Um, and everyone has their scope of practice that they're comfortable doing or they're not comfortable doing. Um, perfect example is, is uh, when I worked in Canada, the periodontist, uh, he would do his own treatment planning uh, with, you know, on a cone beam and, and, and put it in there. But it comes to a point where, you know, he can be making, I don't want to make up numbers too exaggerated, but, you know, $2,000 an hour versus him sitting at a computer doing, doing uh, uh, treatment planning. So, you know, everyone has their scope of practice. Some are going to be very comfortable uh, going through the volume, doing their own reports uh, versus others. You know, it's, it's either a waste of time or it's just not, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond, you know, what, what they want to spend their time on. So was there any more questions? This is opportunity for Q&A session. And I hope I didn't go too fast. Uh, next week, we're going to go through a lot of cases, a lot of volumes, uh, and really find those key incidental findings that everyone you know, is, is curious about. This was really just to show you how we get to diagnosis. And next week, we're really going to show common uh, radiographic findings. Uh, and, and I'm hoping to have a, a poll system so you can actually do multiple choice uh, and, and uh, make your own educated guess what you might think it is. But that is everything. If there's any questions there, Andy. Yeah, so it's about 1.43, so we have a, a decent amount of time for some Q&A, so I'm going to go ahead and encourage everybody to, to go ahead and submit some questions and, um, of course, thank everybody for their patience with kind of the, the background noise and the, the audio issues going on. Unfortunately, it took kind of the, the better half of the presentation to resolve that, but um, we do have a question. Is osteomyelitis prevented with an antibiotic course after extraction? I uh, see, th and I, <laughs> to me, that's you're you're. It's already leaning towards more of a treatment. I that would be very specific for the uh, referring dentist. I would say most likely uh, uh, osteomyelitis and antibiotic uh, coverage. Um, but you know, beyond that, that that's that's beyond that's beyond my scope of practice. Uh, that that to me is is already that's getting towards a treatment uh, portion. But I honestly have a that, question. I'm actually really curious if, if there's an oral surgeon or, or uh, another dentist that you know knows the answer to that. that that's that's a great question. So we have another question. Um, can you suggest a book regarding dental radiologic differential diagnosis? Uh, yes. Uh, it's it's the White and Farrell textbook. It's it's probably a very extensive. Um, because there, you know, half of the textbook is about the radiation physics, but that is our main textbook that we use for uh, our boards. Uh, of course, there's you know Huda, which is more um, uh, pathophysiology, but for differential, the White and Farrell uh, textbook I, I'd recommend. And there's you, you could probably find because there's so many versions. I, I would still think the sixth edition. I think there's already eight editions. Um, the sixth edition is still, you know, pretty pretty relevant and still good enough to be relevant to, um, uh, but you know, cone beam CT. But really, you know, the seventh edition and eighth edition, they they really pushed a lot more uh, cone beam cone beam images. We have another question for: What are the liability implications regarding CBCT? Do you need an official report, or are dentists able to interpret scans? Anyone can interpret it. The only thing is the ADA clearly states that there has to be a, a, a report. And you think, oh, no, well, I've been taking, you know, PAs and I've never had to do a report. But you, you do. The second a, a, a dentist does an FMX, you know, it's, it's noted and all the findings are noted, you know, which teeth had periapical lesions or didn't. Um, I, I don't know at what points. You know, it has to like again. I'm, I'm not pushing that it has to be done, but it or it, you don't need a physical radiology report, but it has to be noted of the findings within a cone beam. 
And that's why there, there's some dentists out there that they send me every single case because uh, it, they, they want to be able to give it to a patient. And I should actually stress about that. Um, you know, the having a radiology report with all the findings in it, like now you, you can share it to the patient. And I'm, I, I call it being diplomatic. I don't know who did the treatment in the mouth. So I never, you know, make comments calling out, oh, poorly endodontically treated or implanted a sinus. You know, I'll, I'll say, you know, the implant intersects with the floor of the maxillary sinus um, and no abnormalities are associated with the findings. So I always try to, you know, word it that way. Uh, because again, you know, the, my referring dentist, I don't know if they did the treatment or not. And I, you know, I worked as a dentist. I'm not saying I was ever perfect, um, you know, with, with treatments, but, uh, I, you know, what, what has to be perfect is, you know, when the radiology case comes to me, I need to make sure that I'm not missing anything because that's all sudden on my liability. Uh, in the meantime, uh, while we're answering some more questions, someone's wondering if you could just go back to the slide where you had the uh, the decision tree for lesions or the flow chart. Yes, um, right there. And I, I once I received this, I really thought it was it was it was great. It was cool, you know, because it kind of keeps your mind focused, you know, because you start looking at a lesion. And your mind's going cysts, but then you're like, oh, well, a differential could be, you know, uh, amenoblastoma or, or this and that. But what, was there enough information for you to go that way, to go to an aggressive neoplasm? Or could your mind just stayed on the cyst and, and thought, you know, what, what is the action and, and what are the next following steps? All right. And then we have some, some questions. Uh, if you could briefly just uh, repeat a description of, you know, what you're what the axial versus coronal versus sagittal views provide, and also your thoughts on field of view as far as um, what your thoughts on what field of view they should be using, depending on you know the treatment or what area of the mouth mouth they're they're focusing on. Absolutely, I, I'm a strong believer that the smaller the volume, the better. You're going to have higher resolution, um, and I'm I'm not going to plug any company here or there, but I do have my own personal opinions. Um, but there's some machines out there now that are getting to the, down to that 80 microns, which is just incredible. But you're not going to get that 80 microns in a 15 by 50. You know, you're, you're, you're already, up, already up to the 300, 200 or 300. Uh, you need that small five by five to get all that information. Um, you know, it's, it's said all the time, oh, hey, you know, why don't you get the machine that gives you the most versat versatility? But I have ended on as colleagues, you know, they, they just need the machine that's getting them that five by five or 10 by 10. That's To me, that's the magic number because you're gonna have a lot less incidental findings. You're gonna have that higher resolution, uh, giving you less scatter and less dose to the patient. So, um, you know, eight by eight, 10 by 10, I think are the magic numbers, especially, um, you know, if they're they're being implants, like, you know, we I work here at Implant Concierge and, uh, you know, you don't want that single arch. Actually, it's okay having a single arch, but you don't want uh, just a quadrant. Um, unless again, you know, you're, you're, you're doing endodontic treatment because then, you know, there's, there's some machines I've seen the, the image quality is so incredible that you're able to see fractures and this, you know, that hasn't been possible in, in the past. Uh, but there's a lot of, and I'm going to say the last year or two, some really, really great machines have come out. Um, so a description. So let, let's go back to this one. So again, you got your location, key, you know, where is it located? It's going to give you an idea of what, what you're looking at, something odontogenic or non-odontogenic. That's the, that's the two main ones you're really considering. Uh, internal structures, that's your radiolucency, radio opacity, um, your high density, low density, soft tissue density. Um, periphery, this is ill-defined versus nicely corticated. Again, you know, this, that's going to lean one way versus another. Uh, is the shape regular? Is it round? Um, and really, you know, the effect on the surrounding structures is really going to give you the best idea. Um, and this guy right here, um, you know, I don't, I don't have the most perfect cross sections. And then I'm hoping next week we will go through volume so we can go back and forth and look at all the, the cross sections. Uh, but this one here, uh, the apices of the dentition weren't in that finding. 
I can't say lesion because it's if it's more of a finding than than something pathological, uh, being a traumatic bone cyst. Um, but you know that that's that's giving you a better idea of, of you know what's happening with the surrounding structures. You know, is there interruption of the cortical outlines? Uh, are there is a resorption of the the teeth? Those are going to be you know clues and and cues that it's going to be something a little bit more aggressive. And then about the cross sections, let me go back to this one. Um, we, we, we covered this a bit last week, but really I use the axial to look at, you know, I have a very systematic approach. I look at everything. I go anterior to posterior using the coronal view, looking at the paranasal sinuses, looking at the nasal cavity for the cervical spine um, or, uh, you know, region of the uh, 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 pituitary gland. That's I'm going to be using the, the sagittal view. Calcifications in the neck, also sagittal view. I really save axial view when I'm looking at the apices of the dentition. I really find I find the most significant findings uh, in the axial view when I'm I'm using that uh, solely for the dentition. Chronal, sagittal, those are those are my go-tos. So we have a question about uh, the best view for implant planning, and if you don't mind, Dr. Morchat, I'll weigh in on that a little bit. Um, from the implant concierge side of things, but I would imagine that would depend on on your treatment plan. Um, obviously, if you're doing a full arch uh, treatment for this patient, you're going to need to be able to capture the full arch. Um, if you're doing a single unit, then I suppose you could focus your field of view in more on that area, but you also have to keep in mind if you're planning on doing um, guided surgery, then even if it is going to be you know a single implant case, you may still want that the field of view that can capture the full arch so that you can have uh, the stability of a full arch surgical guide. Because at the end of the day, a guided solution, whether, you know, implant concierge is providing that or yourself or someone else, um, we can only design as far as we can see. Um, and then kind of a, a follow-up field of view question is we have one asking if a 10 by 10 is good for airway and sleep apnea. I, I, I do not think so. Um, like in, in this report here, um, are you going to see some structures? Yes, but you're not going to get the full image in my mind. Uh, you know, airway, I, it's still that 15 by 15 or, or larger, uh, I think is ideal because also airway, there's, there's so many structures around it. Like it, it could be associated with the, you know, the condyles, you know, is there uh, hyperplasia of the condyles? Um, uh, you, you know, is there enlarged tonsils? Uh, really, if, if you're talking, if, and that's what I was saying, like eight by eight, 10 by 10, those are my magic ones, because I think that's, um, for the average ge general dentist, you're going to avoid the most number of incidental findings. Uh, but, uh, airway, I, I think it's important. I think it is important to capture the, the, the condyles, uh, capture the whole, uh, soft tissue area, um, airway studies. Don't forget. It's, it's not just, uh, you know, sleep apnea. They, they, they could have, you know, enlarged. Um, I already said large tonsils or, or something else going on, but yeah, I, I would still recommend a uh, larger field of view for the airway. So earlier for the, the treatment of the osteomyelitis, you asked if anybody wanted to weigh in. So we actually have an oral surgeon, Dr. Pham, uh, weighing in. Thank you so much for, for giving us um, some insight, Dr. Pham. He says treatment of osteomyelitis of the jaws includes elimination of the cause, incision and drainage, sequestrectomy, um, saucerization, and he's really making me pronounce some difficult words right now, uh, decortication, resection of the jaw, antibiotics, and hyperbaric oxygen. Absolutely, yeah. I actually forgot about the hyperbaric chamber. That, that, you know, that is part of the typical management. We have about five minutes remaining, so any other questions to come through, we'd be more than happy to take a couple more before we conclude today's webinar. And uh, just just making one little point, you know, in the in the survey, if there's uh, a few people that really there's a specific lesion they want to see in different ways they it might present 
uh, just put it in the survey and, and uh, I can add it to the, my presentation. Like, you know, some, some of the major ones, you know, amyloblastoma, of course, I'm going to have in there. Uh, OKC, the, those are very common findings, you know, in, including, you know, peripheral lesions. Uh, but, you know, I, I showed that one with uh, uh, ossifying fibroma. That it's so rare. <clears throat> and, it, you know, once you see it, you know that something has to happen, a referral. So here we, we have an interesting question. Um, can a patient consent for a CBCT reading? Um, as in, can they consent saying they do not want their scan to be read by a radiologist? That, that's a really tough legal question. Um, I don't think it's, and again, you know, there's, everyone's going to have a different opinion of this. Um, should it, a radiology report be done on a, like a large scan? Again, it's, it's, it's going to be the, the scope of practice of the, of the doctor. Uh, but I feel like now you're putting... Uh, that treatment's in the patient's hands, it'd be, to, to me, it's like, oh, you know, you have a, a, a fractured tooth and, you know, can you consent that you're, you're not, you don't want treatment of it? I, I, I don't know, that, that's a, you know, that's, that's too legal of a, of a question. Uh, I can tell you one thing, there's not enough radiologists. If all of a sudden the ADA said every single radiology report has to be read by a world maxillofacial uh, radiologist, uh, there's not enough of us. Um, Canada has a rule, I'm, I'm originally from Canada, uh, that anything over an eight by eight, the button has to be pressed by a radiologist and has to be read by a radiologist. The only exception is if an oral maxillofacial surgeon gets enough CE, then they're allowed to as well. But my, my biggest fear, and I tell the same story, is I can really see 10 years down the road, there's gonna be a lawyer on the TV say, hey, uh, did you get a cone beam CT? Do you know have, uh, you know, uh, some kind of cancer? Call 1-800 and, you know, and then also it's, it's, it's going to be like the floodgates are going to be opened up, you know, on the unusual findings that should have been caught, you know, that weren't caught. Uh, that's that's my concern. But again, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. Um, I, again, it's the scope of practice of the dentist. It's not my right to tell a dentist that, hey, you know, you have to, um, you know, extract every third molar you see or something, you know, that, that, that wasn't a good example, but that, that's my stance on it. We have a question for how often do you find calcifications in the brain and what is the protocol when you find one? Um, I'm going to say probably 30 to 40%. Uh, it really comes down to just uh, risk factors. If, if the patient has, you know, a lot of Atheromas like in the in the brain and the, the neck, uh, they're higher at risk. If it's just a little bit of calcification, uh, that that you know, like how often I see the pineal gland calcified, um, there there's you know, there's there's no action needed for that. Uh, it's really just assessing the patient's overall health and their risk factors.